in a way not and there's been a lot of concern because people who knew the old group, the group that's been here since 1985, know that Sam Harvey was very dedicated to gathering some information. And when we get to the slideshow at 6.30, you'll get a visual sense of that. Uh, and Sam Harvey is also known for uh, a certain kind of humor that uh, you have to say is an acquired taste. And that part of his life, I think we could talk about uh, later tonight during the LTG show, because Lloyd needs new humor material, and uh, certainly you could just tell some stories that Sam used to say. Uh, but he was also uh, very dedicated to research. And I think part of what Expo has been about since the very beginning is research and helping all of us know what we have all accomplished as a community. And I'll have more to say about that later, but at this point, I just want us all to uh, remember Sam for all the good work he did in our respective ways of remembering him. Uh, Rob, next item. By the way, Sam was also the serial king, serial number king. He would call under every game to get serial numbers. All right. Uh, every year we have our Hall of Fame presentation, and this is a recognized people in the industry that have gone beyond the call of duty. And I've asked a very special person to help me with the inductions tonight, Gary Stern. Gary, will you please come up front? Okay, all right, okay. Um, it, it was quite a shock. It shouldn't have been a shock, but to hear that Sam wasn't going to be here, he was part of this, part of this, is it part, he was an institution here, so I was you know, shocked by it, floored by it, whatever. Um, all right, L'Chaim. A little grease. Ah, so, um, why, does the honoree come up while we do this? Or wait, am well, I asking you your preference here? We, they should come up right whenever you call their name. Well, then, then John Bascalia needs to come up here. Donnie! Well, Donnie! Come on, John. Over here. We'll say, I hope I can read myself here. You know, before, before I even start with John, Everybody that we're going to talk about tonight are professionals before pinball, or, or in spite of pinball, or in addition to pinball. They're all uh, people who know what in different fields. They're experts in those fields, and they came into pinball. They're not great because of pinball. Pinball is great because of them. And you like that one, huh? You can use. But this is true. This is true. Now, John. John uh, has been with us. He joined us at the end of 2012. And, uh, you know, again, professional before here. Um, he, um, I should read about him and not about Jody. <laughs> okay? So we'll get him. But Jody also is professional. All right. Gradu graduate from Georgia, summa cum laude. I looked that up, and I have to tell you, I was surprised. Uh, but... But obviously, he, he, he earned it and, and so forth. He also has a graduate degree in education. And you say, education, what's that have to do with all, all of this? Well, we'll come back to that, because it does have something, something to do with it. Um, when we decided to elevate our, our, the consumer side of our business, to adjust it, shift our emphasis to um, not only commercial, but also you all, uh, to uh, home, home ownership, home play, so forth. Um, we looked at how to grow the business and, and how to manage the business. We were we were very small in in 2012. You know about when that happened. We had gone through some tougher times, the Lehman Brothers recession. So we looked for a new uh, CRO, Chief Revenue Officer, that's sales and marketing, 
And so we had a headhunter, a headhunter who found many different, filled many different positions for us, found Seth for us. Um, and so this headhunter goes around, uh, his name's Berkey, he goes around and, you know, they research, they find people. And we interviewed a lot of sales and marketing people, most all from the Chicagoland area. Guys selling stuff to Walgreens. The guy said, well, sales is sales. I saw one resume that was not from Chicago, Atlanta. Come next to me. Don't be so shy. Come next to me. It had one word on it that told me that he knew something about what we were trying to do. The word was Tops. Tops is the trading card company. John was with Tops for 20 years, uh, started as a salesman, uh, moving up to the uh, senior VP of sales and marketing or something like that. And this was a big company. This is a billion dollar company. Um, it was uh, bought by Michael Eisner, who used to run Disney. And he was part of the Eisner's team there. Tops is a collectible. And we were changing what we were doing with pinball. So he appeared to be a good potential candidate. So we, we asked him to come up to Chicago. And of course he did and we had dinner. He thinks we interviewed him a bunch of times. I don't think we did. I think we hired him, you know, based on that interview. And he came with us and has developed our business, developed our sales and marketing from about four people to about 40 people. Um, he, he knew collectibles, and so that was important to us. Um, he didn't really know much about pinball, but he learned it. He learned the commercial side. He'll tell you it took him about three years to get the commercial side on, under uh, his belt. Um, but in that time, he developed a big, a big organization to do all the things we're doing. Uh, he's got, under him, he's got sales and marketing. He's got uh, uh, logistics. He's got um, uh, PAM, and our PAM, or parts, accessory, or merchandise business, has grown to a real business with him and with Ryan, Ryan over here working with him. And, uh, and we got a bunch of people here who work for him, which is a, a compliment to him. Um, the Stern Army, totally, totally John. Totally John, it's a street team. Okay, he had done a street team of some sort before, uh, but you, you learn from past experiences and he made it, made it work for us. Um, launch parties, never existed before. Um, the, this one you all may not know too much about, the Beatles program, which came about um, <laughs> one afternoon. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's motorcycles and beer go together well. Yeah, yeah, thank you. We'll come back to that in a minute, okay? And uh, so uh, he came up with the, uh, that, that program. Costco, you all know that we have games in Costco. And this is really important what John did here. It's important because we are going to increase the community. We can get new first time buyers. Uh, you all may say, well, why should they buy uh, a Costco, one of your games from Costco when they can get a used game? They don't want a used game. They want to buy a game, bring it home and play it. And we hope they really love it and decide to be part of the community. Those games are attachable to Insider Connected. And Insider Connected, okay, here we go. The future of any product is connectivity today. Everything's gotta be connected. My car, I start with my phone. My washer dryer calls me. Every product is connected. Our pinball machines are connected. You can play them unconnected, but you can't get the full uh, game uh, uh, without being connected. You need the cloud, you need, to, you need your achievements, you need us to uh, send you contracts so you have to go out and, 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 and play the game. All this is, is what the future of pinball is and he has adapted to it and he is marketing it and he is an important part to it. Any game that's not connected, any product that's not connected won't have a future. He's building our future. He's building your future and our future. So all kinds of different programs he's, he's been involved in. He, he also keeps track of where we're at. He does what we call, he calls a risk assess assessment, telling us where we're at every week. Uh, and 
you know, predicts and uh, what we're doing. He's managing what, what we're, what we're going to build with, to a large extent. So in the, in the last decade that he's been with us and been in pinball, he's been an important part of building pinball and of building Stern from what it was after the Lehman Brothers recession to what it is today and what it's going to be in the future. He also, here's my, here's, uh, my education thing, he's built brought, with his education degree, he has mentored and taught these 40 people and used his background to do that. So all of his background, not in pinball per se, all of his general background, is this true of all the people we're going to talk about, is using their general background to help increase pinball and increase your hobby, my business, and see growth from the last decade and into the next decade. Harley. Harley, uh, we're a game company. We talk about being a game company. We used to talk about being a lifetime, uh, a, a, a lifestyle. Harley's a lifestyle. He has a Harley. He understands collector, collector, collectibles. He understands lifestyle. He's got a fancy Harley, fancier than my Harley. Three times the cost of my <laughs> Harley. Uh, any event, he's got a Harley. We will next year, Jack was busy this year with X-Men. Uh, we will next year bring you the next episode, John, <laughs> Jack, and me, the next X episode of Stern Hogs. Okay. Okay. So, with that, I, I'm going to present John, tell you that he well deserves this. The last decade has been part, a large part his decade, and so, John, I thank you very much, and I, this is presented to John Viscalia in commemoration of your induction into the Pinball Hall of Fame, October 18, 2029, signed by Rob Burke, Chairman. Oh. You get in the middle. You're the, wait, yeah, you're the you're supposed the, to be in the yeah, middle. Man. You're the man. Thank you. So, do I get to say anything? You do. Oh, good. Right. You do. Oh. You do, but you know, you know, I got a hook that's okay. Put if, if if you see Gary doing this, tell yeah. me, please, okay? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it 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 rolled it rolled like that. Um, this is the, uh, honestly, this is quite a, a an honor. So hopefully, I won't start breaking down and crying. But um, I truly want to thank um, Rob Burke for putting all the effort into doing this year after year after year after year and bringing us all together because this truly is a family. Um, I also want to thank Gary. Because if it wasn't for Gary, we probably wouldn't be making pinballs right now as an industry. When when this business hit its ups and its downs, Gary's tenacity never, ever, ever wavered. Gary's decision to move forward and make games for our community, for our family, um, it never wavered. So we owe him just an absolute huge, huge uh, vote of gratitude. I mean, he's, he's, he's very special, and we're very lucky to have him. Um, I'm going to basically say that this has been an amazing, I'm in my 12th year, and, and quite frankly, the reason is, is because I've got to meet so many amazing people. And when I had uh, left Tops, when I had got, gotten out of Tops, I actually went back to school to get my master's to change careers. I always wanted to be a special education teacher, and I had already gotten through my master's, summa cum laude. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'll tell you, I barely got out of college initially, so that was uh, quite a thing. But um, I got a call from these guys, and they brought me up. And I was so enamored, I was so unbelievably overwhelmed with the type of products that we were selling to the people that we were selling to. The reason I was attracted to Tops, the reason I wanted to work at Tops, is because we were all about connecting people to their passion. 
And that's just a huge thing because we're all individuals we, and we all get lonely and we all need friends and we all need socialization. We need to, we need to just simply enjoy other human beings and not be afraid and, and, and have all the things and the stresses that we go through in life, you know, just break away. And pinball allows for us to do that. These games that people gather around and they laugh and they play and they join tournaments and they go to events and they do all these things. It's just connecting people. It's creating and enhancing life, life within each, uh, within what we do, how we, how we exist, who we are as people. It becomes such a part of our identity that I was overwhelmed with a sense of passion in this particular industry. I look around at the faces, and I and, and every one of them has a story. And I've gotten to meet, you know, the majority of the people in this room. And it's like, goodness gracious, you have Walter Day, you know, who just keeps banging it out and just makes all of our lives better. You know, you have people out there that just will not give up because they want us to connect. And honestly, this industry is just all about locking arms. And we've got guys, you know, our most recent game, Jack Danger, just working 20 hours a day for months and months and months. And you come in, and he's there, and you go home, and he's there, and you can watch the black bags under his eyes <laughs> grow every single day and what these people put into it. And, and I'm not going to call too many people out, but the Pat Powers, who never misses a phone call, and the, and the Pablos, the service team and such. It goes on and on and on, and I, I won't take up too much more time. But I will say, guys, we are really fortunate to be in a community, to have a product, to connect all of us, because we would not be here right now. And just think about all these relationships that we made and think about who we are and how important pinball is to each and every one of us. So that's why I'm not teaching right now, whether it's in some school or in a college or whatever. That's why I'm here. And, and I'm kind of an insecure person, and I've always had to work really hard to get anything. And, and, and I have worked hard at this, and, and I'm, I'm humbled by it, you know, and I, and I really, truly say that, you know, it's like, oh, my God, am I worthy of this? to be a part of this. And I've only been here for, you know, a relatively short period of time compared to the people that have been here. So this is something special, folks, and I want to celebrate it with all of you. I I'm honored, be honored beyond words, and, and, and I'm humbled. But most importantly, this will go on a wall and it will re just remind me and, re and I'll remember forever the amazing people that I've met, the amazing products that I've got to experience, and the people that built these, these are, are the most dynamic, the most loving, caring, supporting people within any community that I've ever met, including Harley communities. It can be a little bit nasty. So <laughs> with, with that said, um, thank you. I, I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for, for, for allowing me this. I'm following, I'm following my leader here. I don't know. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Jerry Thompson. Jerry Thompson. Okay. Let's see. I have some notes for you, Jerry. Where are you? Well, you've got to be right here. You've got to be right here. Come on up. Ah. Okay. For you, I said before that uh, all of these people weren't just pinball people. They worked. They were experts. They were accomplished in their various genres. Jerry is Thompson Audio Productions. Yeah. Come up here, <laughs> would you? I, I, I had to look this up, you know. <laughs> Thompson Audio Productions. He does voiceover. He does uh, uh, radio, TV commercials. Um, uh, the GAC Nights on the Radio. That's a country was a country show. The Better Show on TV. Uh, every year, the Parnelli Awards. Um, other things that have nothing to do with pinball. 
Um, for those of you who want to give him some work, contact in L.A. or New York. The <laughs> uh, Here we go. Where did I put that? Uh, what's your agency? CESD. CESD. <laughs> It's a talent agency, so they they book him. And, and so, he's, you know, this is not just a pinball guy. He's great for pinball, but he he has expertise. He has expertise in uh, voiceover. He has ex expertise in announcing. He has expertise in creating music and writing music and licensing music, which I'll come to. Mm -hmm. uh, sound effects, everything that goes in a pinball machine. So yeah, he does our pinball machines. He really though, as I understand it, was did some voiceovers for us and then was asked to do the uh, uh, Nelly voiceover. Right. And uh, I think uh, uh, you guys said, oh, uh, let him do the whole game. And David Thiel had uh, yeah. referred him right. for this. I'll, so. I'll, I'll tell it. Yeah, I'll tell about that. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll tell, I'll tell okay. the whole story. Okay. I won't go on too long, but I'll tell. Yeah. I'll tell yeah. You. Okay. There's some people to thank for. That. Okay. <laughs> well, you certainly, you know, we certainly want to hear that. Um, so, you know, he's been a great contributor to our pinball, and when I say a great contributor, okay, I have a list. I have a list. So, starting at the bottom in 2015, we got Woe Nelly, Ghostbusters, and Paps Can Crusher in 2016, Batman 66 in 2016. If I could read this fast, it'd be really cool, but I'm not going to. Uh, Star Wars 2017, Supreme. Um, now, there's an interesting game. Uh, the private label, special game. That really made history for pinball. It got us a lot of publicity. It really brought pinball uh, to, um, um, uh, to to be recognized by a whole new group of people. Uh, Iron Maiden, Deadpool, uh, Primus, Beatles. That was a busy 2018. <laughs> the Monsters, Black Knight, Sword of Rage, uh, Jurassic Park, Elvira's House of Horrors. That's 2019. Busy. <laughs> Did you have time to do other work while this is going? I got on? married and took a two-week European vacation in 2018 and five games. So. Were, were you late? <laughs> were you late on any of those games because no, of that vacation? No, okay, no. no. He's always on time. <laughs> this is important. Being on time. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You guys heard some about it if you were in the last uh, in the uh, licensing uh, interview. Uh, uh, Avengers: Infinity Quest. Heavy Metal. That's 2020. I may be leaving some out here. This is a list I got. Mandalorian in 2021. My uh, granddaughter is uh, a big Mandalorian fan. She's seven, uh, so she has the game. Godzilla. And then in uh, 2022, James Bond. Um, Venom in 23. Jaws in 2024. Uncanny X-Men. And now Metallica Remastered. And, and when I say did these games, we've got music. Licensed music, sometimes written music, sometimes music from smaller license license uh, ores that you get for us, right. which always I said, okay, I have to assume, you know, but you, you said you knew what you're doing. Okay. <laughs> then there's sound effects. There's speech. There's choreography of all this. All this, because you don't just record this stuff. You've got to put it in, you know, in some way that the uh, programmers can, cor uh, can chore uh, choreograph it. So there's a lot that goes in to the pinball machines. So this guy is, are you still doing the other work? Yes. Yes, <laughs> and doing our games. So again, somebody else from uh, another person, expert in the genre that's adapted it and became a big contributor to pinball. So with that, we thank you. And I present to you, presented to Jerry Thompson in, co in commemoration of your induction into the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame, October 18, 2024, Rob Burke, Expo Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me have a legacy. <laughs> really. Making my legacy. <laughs> you made my legacy. Thank you. I like your shirt. <laughs> uh, to, were we doing a picture uh, first? Yeah, you're in the middle. Come, come, oh, come okay. in. Yeah, you're in the middle. Okay. you got to be in the middle. <laughs> Let's try and get in the right order this time, huh? So I know we're short on time. I went to too long, but I would like to tell you real quickly how I got from out there to up here and thank the people that are responsible for that. Um, I came to my first Pinball Expo 20 years ago this month. 
But before, before that, I bought my first pinball game in 1998. Didn't know anything about pinball. Um, but I had seen it four years earlier in a Kmart um, customer service area. And I was like, well, it was with my girlfriend at the time. I was like, oh, man, I love Twilight Zone. I got to get one of those. And she said, I would never have one of those things in my house or, or a big screen TV. And so, sadly, I knew then she was not the one. But, um, so when e eBay came around in 1998 and I got the machine, and you know how it goes. You get one, and then that turned into three, and then five, and now the 30 we have in the house now. And I, I did marry the right one. Um, but so I got totally immersed and hooked on pinball. Came to my first pinball expo, as I said, in, in 2004. Uh, subscribed to Pin Game Journal, learned all I could about it. Kept coming back to expo, dragging my stuff through the autograph line and getting it signed. So in 2008, a handful of friends and I thought, well, we should try to do our own show in Seattle. So we have a nonprofit show that's still going on, the Northwest Pinball and Arcade Show. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so... Uh, the, I had read in Pin Game Journal that David Thiel, the Stern sound guy, lived in the area, so I invited him to our show the first year, and we became friends and concert buddies. The next year, I invited Greg Freres and Dennis Nordman, and they got the idea while they were there to do this customized game uh, called Wonelli, uh, based on some old EM games that they were converting. So fast forward to 2015, January of 2015, Greg Ferris called me in a life-changing call and said, hey, I know you were a major market radio DJ and you do audio production, and since you were the reason we got together and, uh, and uh, made Wonelli, I'm, I'm at Stern now and they're going to produce it. You should do the audio for it. So um, while I was doing that, Dwight Sullivan called and said, hey, I met you at Expo. I remember uh, I need some help with Game of Thrones, and Greg Ferris said to call you. So I would not be standing here without Greg Ferris. And um, while we were doing that, yeah, yeah, he deserves a hand. So while we were working on Game of Thrones, I said to Dwight, I said, I know you're going to do Ghostbusters, and I really would love to do that game. I, I, David Thiel had decided to move on by then. And Dwight said, you know, it's a big job, and uh, you don't have any experience. I, I don't know. I, I, uh, I, I just don't know. And I, So I said, look, I'm, this is my era. I already hear how the game should sound in my head. I really, I got a great guy that does music that I played in a band with. I can do this. And so he's like, I'm starting to believe you. So he said, let's go talk to George. So we went to George Gomez and he's like, I don't know. It's a big job. You've never done one by yourself. And I said, give me a month. And if it doesn't work out, get rid of me, but please give me a chance. So 25 games later, it's looking like it might work out. <laughs> so I am, uh, I'm forever grateful to Greg Ferreris, Dwight Sullivan, who taught me how to make a great game. And um, um, it's just, you know, it's been an amazing 10 years. And so I also have to, uh, have to thank George Gomez. I mean, never seen a more creative guy and a better problem solver. And have to thank Gary for keeping the doors open 25 years ago when, you know, pinball could have gone away and given me this legacy. I mean, it's such an honor. I'm thrilled for this. I appreciate everybody. Um, oh, I have to thank Rob, of course, for 40 years of this. Man, that's a long time to. <laughs> and and that's when there were, that's when there were no other shows every weekend, you know, like there are now. I mean, he was the originator. And um, also have to thank David Thiel when I, I called and said, Hey, Stern's gonna let me do a game. Now, how do I do that? <laughs> and he said, I'll give you, I'll tell you what programs to uh, get. I'll give you my templates and get you started. And uh, so thankful for that. I have to thank my wife because she said, if you ever get on an award, uh, up and get an award, I, you better thank me. So thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> and uh, I thank you to everybody at Stern. I, I'm so proud and honored to be with all the great people at the biggest and best pinball company in the world. And lastly, thank you for playing and buying Stern pinball games so we can keep doing what we love. Thank you. Okay, Jody. Up you come. Up you come. Well, wake up. Well, wake up.
again, somebody who doesn't just work in pin, didn't just work in pinball, but came from genres that are that he was professional in, accomplished in, and adapted to, and became important to pinball. Uh, Jody joined us in January of 2012. No, he didn't. The recession, dude. You were out of business, 2009. Our personnel department doesn't know you were there. I hope you got paid. I was a consultant for Dave Peterson. Oh, you were a consultant. No, you joined us, joined us permanently. No, I, you came, got I stuck. came in 2009. Uh, you see? You see what we got here? No, some things never change, and then it's not going to change. So, all right, 2009. You got a pen. Years. You got a pen? Yeah. Give me a pen. Write it down on your machine. Give me a Try pen. It. Okay. Change that. It's October 2009. Okay. Because fail, I was fail. the first pinball expo I ever went to. <laughs> fail. I, I failed on my research, but I do know that, as I said, he came from. Uh, I'm going to say some things that are going to be a little. People they'll they'll be completely incorrect, and we'll figure it out. You see the relationship here, okay? You got this. You all get this, okay? Just keep it up. Keep it up. Um, entrepreneur with a, uh, uh, a um, um, with Crank, which was an amp company, uh, did artist relations. Artist relations, music, artist relations. You heard him talk. If you listen to the, uh, uh, the seminar, uh, you heard him talk a little bit about artist relations and, and what he did there. It's things like, oh, guess what? He knows Metallica. Uh, I wonder how we got 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 to do this game again and got them so involved. Um, uh, he joined us, um, and you all know that he that he does licensing for us. Um, but before we talk about licensing. He was new business development in addition to licensing, other things. Um, he actually started our uh, PAM business, our uh, merchandise parts and accessory business. Um, he did our private label games when we thought we needed to make private label games when we weren't so, didn't become so busy making regular games for you all. He created uh, the license, <laughs> this is a scary one, for Supreme. And Supreme was a, a Supreme, as I said a little earlier. This this game put pinball on the map with a whole whole another group of people. That was all him. He created our original presence at the Consumer Electronics Show, um, and he'll probably deny his involvement with the uh, Las Vegas Hall of Fame. But I have no involvement. Yes, yes, you do. And and by the way, the the whole display there is yours. If it's still standing, yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Um, Comic Con. For years, we wanted to go to Comic Con. We wanted to go. We couldn't get there. Jody, because he knows everybody, and especially in the music industry, got us a little space on somebody else's booth. Somebody in the music industry. By the way, it's our booth now, and they get some space on it. In addition, he's he's got us a pop-up arcade for free in the Marriott Hotel next door. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a, a bunch of other things he's done with us beside, for us in addition to licensing. He's been uh, our, our one of our, or our leading pop culture experts, and this is all important to us. But you all best know that he's our director of licensing. How many licenses have you done? I'm not gonna get in trouble. What does it say? I wrote 50-ish, but I don't know. I like that. You like that, okay. I got away with one. Has he let me off the hook for a change? Okay. Okay. Um, he, get, he gets, he finds the right people. He gets this done. And the licensing guy maybe just gets you the title and walks away like some of the others. Or maybe he carries you all the way through. He works with the approval people. This, you know, you got the, there's a sales guy who sells you the license at the, li you know, at the movie company. And then there's a bunch of people that approve what you're doing. That's the hard part, and that's, that's what he does. And it also makes a monkey in the middle because the designers want this, and they don't understand that the license is the other guy's football. He can take it home. And you got to satisfy the licensor. you got to satisfy the designers. So you're monkey in the middle. And now 
we have a new aspect to it for the last five, 10 years. Technology has made it really difficult yeah. because of the submissions and, and how the submissions are made. You used to send an email or something. No, not anymore. There's all kinds of systems for it. He masters all that. He controls all that. Um, We've traveled together. We go to licensing together, licensing shows, and I don't now. He goes with Seth. Uh, when I went, I would sit there and listen, and you know, he'd talk because he knew the pop culture. He knew what was going on. Uh, we traveled together in California, so I could put him in the back of a convertible and put the top top down, or or, or ride around in the powder, powder blue uh, Volkswagen convertible. We got a lot of whistles that day. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what I've learned, and this this is the first one that's uh, uh, what his family's here, and he's very committed to his family, and I've seen that as we've traveled around. I've learned that he's it's some of some of my. Uh, fellow Stern employees are going to say, what? He's patient. He's very patient. What? Yeah. He's very patient. You know, he's, he, he gets this license. We'll sit at a licensing, you know, at a meeting at a licensing show. I said, why are we wasting time with this, with this property, with this person? And he'll sit and he'll make them feel like kings and he'll talk to them because you never know where they're going to be next. You never know what they're going to have next. He's got the patience to do that. I don't. That was shocking when I sat and wrote this down that I'm going to have to say he's patient. He's a pop culture expert, networking. He knows everybody. Again, walk around one of those shows, uh, the Comic-Con or the uh, um, uh, uh, CES or the uh, uh, licensing show. Takes a long time to get around if you're with him. He knows everybody, and, and he, he meets them. He also, uh, he's, um, he knows the titles that he's buying well enough to contribute and help with the game. So he's part of the game design. Now, sometimes everybody doesn't like that, and sometimes he's wrong. He's not right 100% of the time, but he is part of the contribution to the games the games we make, not just with the licensing and getting approvals to, to, to what they're going to do. He is definitely like a dog with a bone. He doesn't, uh, it's, you know, this. ACDC, he mentioned it in the licensing. I mean, that couldn't be done. It was done. He told the story a little different than I remember it because I remember he's just calling me and saying, I'm put, putting you on, on the phone. I was in an airport on the phone with a, uh, with a lawyer, and here, you're on the phone, negotiate with him. Uh, most important, most important for, for us, for business, for whatever, Jody is what they call a hunter. He's not just sit back and do it. He's Hunter. He's going to go out and find it. He's going to find the Supremes. He's going to find somebody for ACDC. He's going to hunt and find something. And that's how you grow a business. You hunt and you find a way to do things. You find a person. So with that, he is obviously the biggest pain in the ass, as you can tell. And although I, I enjoy I'm, try, I'm trying my best. Yeah, very, one of the, he's one of the most trying people I know. Um, and, and with that, you know, I enjoy all of our employees. I really, I really enjoy this man. So, so with that, presented to Jody Dankberg in commemoration of your induction into the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame, October 18, 2024, Rob Burke, Expo Chairman. Only you. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, uh, both these guys. Um, Rob and Gary are the first two people I met when I did pinball. So um, in 2009. In 2009, not in 2012. They didn't start giving me insurance in 2012 till 2012, so that's legit. That's why HR says that. But um, I'll be quick. This is really humbling. Um, I'm unapologetically myself. Sometimes I have to apologize, but I try not to. And um, I really love what I do, and I'm really lucky. My kids are here. They've, I've been doing this for 15 years. They're, the oldest is 13, so they've been 
pinball has been their whole life. They've all laid in white woods when they were babies, and they've all <laughs> they all come to the factory and play play all the games and stuff like that. And um, everybody at work treats them like family. And uh, Gary's like, uh, like a second dad, and I love him. So thank you. All right. If you guys have something planned, I'm sorry. <laughs> but not only can I talk a lot, so can my coworkers, obviously, talk a lot. So I get to do one more. I get to do present uh, to Fred Young. So, Fred, you have to come up here. What? What? Are you kidding? Would I kid you? Oh my God. Come on, come Hello. Come on. Hi. Come on, here we go. Okay. Man of a thousand voices. Okay. Fred's a voiceover artist. He's done many games, but let's talk about. Again, somebody who is an expert and experienced in their genre and bring it to pinball to make pinball great. Um, let's see. First of all, I am Rob. I'm surprised Fred's not already in your Hall of Fame. I can't understand this. You should be, and you deserve to be. So I was taken a little aback, and I said, okay, I'm going to do some work here. Um, but he has a body of work that's extensive in pinball, um, but far broader. He's a Pillsbury Doughboy. Can't you tell by looking at him? Yeah. Yeah. One of the voices of the Pillsbury Doughboy. That's it. Doughboy. Yes, yes, yes. Six Flags, Boris Karloff. Uh, when he started, did his first pinball, he was uh, doing voice uh, voices for and an, an advertising for Allstate Insurance. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, so he's 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 well known and well experienced in voiceover, and that brought it to pinball. And here's a guy who's done a lot of pinball machines, um, often many in the same day, pinball and, and arcade games. So here we go. Oh my God. Okay. Now I'm probably missing some, and some I don't know. He did voices in Crude Buster. King Kong Pinball, which we really don't want to talk about what happened no, to that. That, that. That was all in one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in Back to the Future, he did Marty McFly and uh, Doc Brown. He's an announcer in Checkpoint. Teenage Mutant Turtles, we've talked about a few times. He did male voices in that. Batman, uh, voice of Batman and voice of the Joker. Star Trek. Uh, did voices in it. Hook male voices. By the way, for those of you who uh, can remember Hook, we didn't have uh, Dustin Hoffman's likeness, so the artist used me, and that's me on it, but he's the voices. It's not my voice. Uh, Lethal Weapon 3. Now, that brings up a, a point. I understand that the best and the worst known voice in pinball is Joe Pesci, okay, 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 okay. That was you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Either loved or hated. Um, that's uh, Lethal Weapon 3. Uh, Star Wars, one of the day these Star Wars. Um, Al's Garage Band goes on the wild tour. World tour. World tour. World tour. World tour. World tour. <laughs> that's not mine. You, this man is Aaron Spelling. For when we did the Aaron Spelling pinball. Yeah. If we use you, uh, those of you who don't know, we did a special version of a game, just arted it and voiced it for Mrs. Spelling, wanted it for Aaron Spelling. And we made a big mistake. This was 20 years ago, and we charged for this one special game $200,000. We should have charged 400. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. She didn't care. She didn't care. Uh, Michael Jordan pinball. Um, the uh, Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. You did Bullwinkle, Forrest Badenoff, and the announcer. 
Jurassic Park, all the roles, our first Jurassic Park. Last Action Hero, Jack Slater. Uh, Mystery Castle, who's, whose game is Mystery That's Castle? Alvin G. Alvin G. Yeah. yeah, he did Alvin G in Alvin games. He was going to do a Williams game, Terminator 2. Mm. And he did the voice for Terminator 2. And they sent it to uh, um, um, Schwarzenegger, Arnold, yeah. Arnold to Arnold, and Arnold listened to it and said, that's so good, I better do it myself. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah. Chris Grainer, yes. Yeah, 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 with Chris Grainer, that's right. Uh, last action, uh, Jurassic Park, last action hero, Mystery Castle, Punchy the Clown. Oi. 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 Punchy the Clown, Oi. Oi. <laughs> okay, that it? Okay. Tales from the Crypt. Uh, you were the Crypt Keeper. Pistol Poker. Uh, WWF Royal Rumble. Maverick, the movie. You did the male voices. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. i got to take a rest here. The Golden Tee. That's not a pinball. That's a golf game. That's, right. that's a video. Uh, Zombie Raid, uh, which is a creature sound effects. That's an arcade game. Golden Eye, you did James Bond and Boris uh, Grishnikov. Grishnikov, I can't remember, remember how you pronounce his name. Space Jam, the announcer. Star Wars Trilogy, special edition. We did a lot of Star Wars games over the years. Lost World, Jura World Jurassic Park, Starship Troopers, Viper, Night Driving. Uh, that's because Joe liked Vipers. Um, Harley Davidson, we, uh, the Harley Davidson pinball that we made. Okay. What were you on Harley Davidson? Do you remember? Uh, it's just me, but they said I sounded more like uh, somebody. Uh, uh, that was uh, Lonnie. You know, Lonnie? Lonnie? Okay. Lonnie, right. Yeah, okay. Uh, Sharky Shootout, High Roller Casino, Austin Powers, <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean, Wheel of Fortune. I'll get there soon. Just give me a minute here. Indiana Jones, Batman the Dark Knight, he, play, he was a joker. 24, uh, The Walking Dead, uh, unreleased mini Viper, I don't know what that is, and it says unreleased, I'm not going to go that far, with Tattoo Assassins, which was a video game that, that we all did, and if you can find one, they're, they're pretty special. Um, so with that, He's uh, obviously contributed a lot to pinball and a lot to the voiceover uh, field in general. And for pinball, we thank you, and we're going to present, present it to Fred Young in commemoration of your induction into the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame, October 18, 2024. Rob Burke, chairman, ex 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 Expo Chairman, and it's about time. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Let me get this is perfect for five. What voice am I going to use? I don't know yet. Uh, um, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, this is a total surprise to me. I didn't know I didn't know anything about this, really, honestly. Um, to tell you the truth, this all started back in 1989. Joe Camico and Brian Schmidt yeah. they needed the voices for Star Trek, and they were. I, I had a habit of leaving my demo tape, my character tape, too, and my narration tape at every single production house, every single recording a company because producers, directors, creative directors, clients that come in, they listen. Well, anyway, this is a true story. I'm going to bore you too much. If you want to hear voices, I can do that too. But this is what happened. They were listening to tapes for two hours, nothing, and they needed the Star Trek thing. They went to Gene Roddenberry and Paramount, and they had the licensing and everything, but they couldn't get the voices. So the, after two hours, the engineer said, well, Fred was here. He's doing for the Allstate Network, for Allstate Insurance. And he did a lot of stuff here. Why don't you why don't you pop in the tape? Now the tape I had is Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse, and I did it the way I wanted to do it. Oh yeah, it was really something. <laughs> well anyway, anyway, they were enthralled. Now, I'm going to a funeral 
This is the truth. I was actually going to a funeral, and I get this phone call saying, they want you to do Star Trek for a pinball machine. 198, a pinball machine? I don't know anything about a pinball machine. I know how to record commercials. You know, I was you know, doing the Pillsbury Doughboy and, and uh, all this other stuff, and slide films and educational advice, but a pinball machine? I don't know. So I said, is there any way I can get out of it? Hold on. Wait, it gets, gets interesting. We don't know who the company is. I said, okay. I called my friend up. I said, well, you can't turn down Star Trek in any way, shape, or form. So they called me back, and I said, sounds like fun. And then I met Joe Kamikow, Brian Schmidt, a few other people, and they really want to know, is that really you on that, on that tape? I said, yes, it is. Well, then I started doing Star Trek. And not only did I do Star Trek that day, we did four games that day, Gary. Star Trek, Batman, King Kong, and Checkpoint. All in one day. I said, well, that's nice. Well, now on to something else. Then I got called for Teenage Mutant Turtles. Then I met Gary. And then I got called for Back to the Future. And, uh, and on and on and on and on and on. And since this past week, in fact, I spoke here this past week, you know, since James Earl Jones died, everyone's been calling up and asking me, I want to hear Darth Vader. I want to hear Darth Vader. I said, after a week, I'll do Darth Vader, but not right now. So the week was up, and then it was bothering me. I want to do Darth Vader. I want to do Darth Vader. But I want you to know, I've never met more intelligent, more interesting, and more delightful people than at the Pinball Expo, because you people are the experts. You people who know do the artwork, who does the electronics, who does the uh, cabinet, who does uh, the programming and all that stuff. Because in the beginning, they didn't have a lot of programming. That's what they told me. But as time went on, things built and built and built. But then that's where the acting comes in. Because I was always doing commercials and being at the Children's Theater of Second City, where I played the Frankenstein monster, singing the monster blues and narrating Beauty and the Beast. So the thing is, this is a very, this is very nice and very humming. This is a total surprise. I knew nothing about it. He kept, and Rob probably kept a se this a secret to me, you know. And uh, whenever I did any stuff like Indiana Jones or something, Steve Ritchie and Gary would say, "Hey, that's good. We'll put that in the game." And I don't even know what goes in the game. You know, I don't know. You know, and sometimes the improv gets into the game. But the interesting thing is. I did work very hard on this stuff to make it look effortless when I got into the studio because it takes like two weeks of prep, you know. And then sometimes scripts changes and things. And it was very interesting. Then I got the call for Alvin G and company and Michael Gottlieb and they wanted to use me. And then I got a call from other, other pinball machines. Of course, Punchy the Clown, everyone wants to hear this story about Punchy the Clown. Well, it's a terrible voice, to tell you the truth. It's disgusting. It, it well... <laughs> It's like, huh? well, the original voice, they had him there, but some of them have him. He says, hey, I'm Punchy the Clown, get ready. Yeah, but I got called to do Bozo the Clown also through a company because uh, Larry Harmon lost the tape. But then they want this terrible, disgusting voice. I said, you're kidding, because this, this, this clown gets beat up by children. So I came up with this disgusting voice. It was like, hi, kids. <laughs> I'm Punchy the Clown. <laughs> Horrible, isn't that? Yes. Yes, disgusting. And then, you know, I was doing other things, by the way, that were near misses. I'm not on the Simpsons game. They, they try to get the people there. Okay, I'm not on the Simpsons game. They went to them. I'm not on the Family Guy game. If you have any problems, then give me a call. Otherwise, let it go. Chris Grainer will tell you the story about the Terminator 2. And that, they, I, after 1990, after the first Pinball X, my agent called me up and said, listen, we know you do Arnold. There's a pinball game. We want you to do the Terminator. And that's where I talked to Chris Grainer over the phone. I got hired. I recorded everything. And then Arnold heard my tape. And he said, I better do this after talking to uh, <laughs> a few other people. I better do this because they heard me. You know, so I sort of scared him into it. I re really, it's true. It's true. Because they didn't know what Arnold sounded like, and I did. And I got called in after I heard me over the phone. Because I couldn't tell him what I was doing, which was Teenage Ninja Turtles, for Data East. And the minute when I walked into Bally's, interestingly enough, there's Back to the Future. So he asked me, what are you? I said, Back to the Future. So you're the voice of Michael J. Fox. So how did you know that? It got around time. They had a game there. I said, you listen to everybody's game? Yeah. And then Star Wars came up, and I'm everybody except Princess Leia and R2-D2. And that's really, a, that's really a lot of fun. So it's a lot of fun to do this, and plus it makes everyone happy. You know, I'm also proud of my master's degree thesis. But we have to wind this up. So listen, I want to thank everyone involved with the uh, Pinball Hall of Fame. I, I'm here for everybody. I'll talk to you all later. So listen, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Rob. 
thank everyone here who had uh, an idea to, to induct me into Pinball Hall, and I want to thank you very much, and may the force be with you. Let me pick up my junk. You can have your mic back now. Well, our next inductee is no longer with us, but uh, an important person in pinball art. Uh, like so many things in the 20th century after World War II, there was a rethinking of pop culture and uh, what would pass and be acceptable in America. Uh, Roy Parker was uh, an old school artist, uh, the great artist for Gottlieb Games, and uh, maybe not something that would be acceptable even by the time the 70s came around when Gordon Morrison was doing all his very happy art. And uh, it, it was a necessary change, uh, but there was somebody in between, and that's Art Stenholm, who we are now inducting into the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame. Parker was in some ways a mentor to Stenholm and we don't know exactly what the codependency was between those two in the time frame of 65, 66. Parker died in 66. Uh, Stanholm had been doing work for Williams, beginning with Palooka, 64. Did some work for Bally, Mad World, Bus Stop Aces High, kind of cartoony, funny stuff. But at Gottlieb, he really stretched out. He, he was the guy who had to take over for the great Roy Parker, uh, and do it his way. He did bolder backgrounds, did more stuff with outdoor sports. Uh, you can look up on IPDB all the themes he did. Unusual framing and layout. Remember Four Seasons, which had that crisscross kind of dividing framing. Uh, he did cartoony stuff, but he was also the first artist to do a real psychedelic type back glass before Gordon Morrison, so groovy crescendo psychedelic, the, that's Art Stenholm. Uh, and that means he was around for the debut of the parallel four and two player games, some especially notable early examples before we got it down to just like, uh, you know, do as little as necessary uh, at, with high score and super score. Go look at those two back glasses and look at how interesting they are and how different they are from each other. And also note, as has been noted when the Pacific Pinball Museum did a retrospective on him a few years ago, he made the female characters more active, more than just kind of the decoration or the accessories for the male. Uh, now this wasn't a totally new invention uh, that cowgirls were always uh, acceptable in back glasses, but not much else. Uh, and we think that maybe that's because he had a couple daughters and he wanted to show women participating in life and being active people. It got him in trouble one time with Fun Fair, which is the original Italian Attaball for our fun land and uh, fun park here in the United States. Well, if you remember that glass, he had a woman shooting a rifle at a target at a uh, stand-up booth at a carnival that, as Federico Croce told me, was not acceptable in Italy. They don't believe in women shooting rifles, I guess, even in an amusement context. So he had to get Tivoli a new back glass just for the Italian market. So he was pushing it beyond where he was supposed to, apparently. Uh, by the time of Snow Queen, Snow Derby, and Bristol Hills, that was his last work. Gordon Morrison was clearly the next step in pinball art. But Stenholm did bring some uh, modernization and I think an important cultural bridge between those other two artists for Gottlieb. He passed away in 2007. And I think I have an idea of where we're going to send the plaque to one of those daughters. So 
let's just give a round of applause for Art Stenholm, the great Gottlieb artist. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Roger Sharp, will you help us with our next inductee? This one's going to be tough for me. Um, I hadn't gone to a presentation ceremony in the past few years. Didn't know what um, the assemblage was going to be. So uh, I did not bring anything prepared um, for somebody who is incredibly meaningful in my life. And I try to hold it together as best as I can. Um, this is for Steve Epstein. And for people that know what the relationship was, uh, we were brothers from another mother, truly. Uh, wedded at the hip. For some who knew how we were, we were kind of like Felix and Oscar as the odd couple. But Steve, uh, I wish he was alive for this. It, it took far too long to get him recognized and honored for all that he did. And for those who don't know who Steve was, I happen to have worn a shirt today. The world famous Broadway Archaic. Uh, on the IFPA website, which if I would have known what this was all about, I would have brought what I wrote. I recommend if you have the curiosity uh, to check out the tribute, not only to Dallas Overture, an amazing player who passed away well before his time, but also what I wrote about Steve. Um, probably one of the most influential operators in the entire industry who influenced game design, who offered insight because it became a test location for everything. We're talking about video games. We're talking about pinball. We're talking about it all. Uh, Steve was there on the front lines. and. I know people like Steve Ritchie, Eugene Jarvis, and so many others really recognized and appreciated all the insight that Steve gave them, not just in regard to revenue, but in regard to the setup of games. What do you need to change? Is it a post adjustment? Is it something to make that video game more difficult? How are you going to maximize the revenue and more importantly, the return over a longer period of time? Steve worked very closely with me in terms of game design. Um, I have the, uh, the privilege of him uh, providing for people who know Sharpshooter. Uh, well, you're going to do galloping hooves for the spinner, aren't you? <clears throat> and it was like, I hadn't thought of that. I had gunshots and I had TNT explode. Yes, thank you. And then we were able to get together and I don't know if, who's still here to watch and listen to this, uh, we got to collaborate on a game uh, called Las Vegas, which I do believe Steve Ritchie uh, labeled as Las Bogus. Uh, for those who uh, were here yesterday for Doug Watson's presentation, uh, Barracora was the result. Um, nobody liked Las Vegas. We had a uh, roulette wheel underneath the center of the play field went back, did some modifications. I know that this is running long, but this is important to me in terms of Steve and, and really wanting to give him his due. But uh, we went back to try to come up with names of games that had seven letters. It's Las Vegas. I have these targets over here and whatever, and it's like cowgirls. And we, we came up with a whole list of things. And I remember flying out, and the late Steve Kordak met me at the, uh, at the door. And we go into the factory for those who were either present during some of the walkthroughs years ago when they opened up the factory or have seen pictures. And there was a long line, and we're, we're going down the row. And I see this picture of this, like, woman's head 
with fish coming out or whatever else. And it's like, okay, I don't know what's there. That's, that's our game. Now, the first thing was I, I didn't even know how to pronounce Barracora. I mean, tried to spit it out. The one thing that I found remarkable was oh, you didn't tell me we could do two letters on one target. I would have come up with eight different letters for a game. So, uh, again, Steve and I worked uh, diligently on that one. Uh, he was involved as well, at least on the periphery, for my other games. Uh, we worked on a video game together called Quadrazome. Uh, I, I tend to speak very ill of video games when I'm in this type of uh, assembly. But uh, for those who know Konami's game Gradius and Nemesis, uh, it was a derivative of what Steve and I presented to them. Uh, before we got uh, knocked off, but uh, anyway, in all in all truth, for what almost 50 years to have a relationship with somebody who was a brother who really provided so much to this community, the love that he had, uh, we created Papa together. Uh, a labor of love for five years to try to create something fundamental that could be the basis for competitive pinball that maybe could elevate it to a sport. Uh, Steve was with me when we started founding as an industry the IFPA and uh, both of us when my son Josh and Zach asked, can you get the rights? We'd like to resurrect it. Um, wound up getting the rights back from the industry association and there was Steve and I at the front lines of it trying to help promoting it. Uh, I know that Steve did a lot of work for Gary in the beginning uh, to try to help reaching out to location owners and operators because he was one of them. He could speak their language. They believed him. He had the credibility. He had the proof that, look, I'm doing it. It wasn't just a question of saying, you do it, I'll do it with you. The very first league that we tried was in Pinebrook, New Jersey, after we had done a couple of tests at the Broadway Arcade. And Ron Colucci had taken over a location that used to be a church. And we went in and we said, look, we will run this. At that point, I was living in Connecticut. Steve was further down in New Jersey. All we need is your players, and we'll set everything up on a Sunday morning. We'll bring bagels or donuts or whatever. Let's see if we can do this. Let's see if it can work. Because in New York, it wasn't valid. We already had our regulars. We already had people that were willing to be put to the test. And lo and behold, the Pinebrook experiment worked. There were times, because it was in the winter, where Steve and I couldn't get there because of the weather and the roads, where they did it themselves. And everything back then, as some people who know me can attest to, uh, I wrote out everything by hand, the schedules, the scoring, and, and all the rest of it. And that's how it all started. So again, humbly, uh, heartfelt, uh, I just want to say congratulations <laughs> to Steve for being inducted into the Hall of Fame. That's Thank you. Okay, uh, we have another uh, part of our uh, ceremony tonight. We're almost about done, guys. But uh, another part of uh, Expo is we have what we call the service and support. Uh, and it's a part of the Hall of Fame that uh, Greg Kimmick came up with. And um, I've asked uh, Roger to once again um, induct our next individual. So you'll make it. This one I could do. I saw her before. I'm hoping that she's here. Uh, Key? Can you come up here? 
Rocky Snodgrass, please. Uh, all right, this one I can hold it together. Um, Ed Adlin, who some of you may or may not know, he's already in the Hall of Fame, uh, publisher of Replay Magazine, uh, one of the major trade publications, and truly, in this day and age, the last remaining one. Um, our relationship goes back uh, over 50 years. Um, Replay has been the Bible for uh, the industry. It was actually the very first um, publication within the industry that I ever did an article for back in 74 when the magazine was kind of starting. Uh, again, Eddie wasn't able to make it. However, I have uh, a prepared statement. Um, God, I'm so freaking old. All right. Joanna Key Boline. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly. Known throughout the coin-op amusement business as Key, has worked for Replay Magazine some 44 years. She came to the publication straight out of California State University, Norridge, and was hired on the spot by Replay publisher Eddie Adlin, who actually wrote this, but it's okay. I mean, after a brief interview as their production manager, her position at Replay is the only real job she's ever had. In addition to producing the monthly journal, Key has written and edited stories, designed ads, and interfaced with the various printers Replay has used over the years. She single-handedly brought the magazine into the digital age, enabling them to actually build the magazine in the Los Angeles area and print and mail it in Pontiac, Illinois. During her early years at Replay, Key met and married Jay Snodgrass, and today they have two grown daughters, Kim and Caroline, the latter's husband, Greg, and a grandson, Griffin, who, as they say, is the apple of grandma's eye. Oh, let's not forget the apple of the other eye, her dog, Libby. Husband Jay continues working in the aerospace industry as an engineer, while Key, as always, labors in the field of pinball, video games, jukeboxes, and all the other machines that populate today's coin-op amusement business by communicating the What's Up news to readers here in Canada and several overseas markets. In closing, and hopefully this resonates with everybody, key is to me what Shelley Sachs was to Gary Stern, that gal Friday who kept me sane and my magazines hitting the press. So with that being said, I'd like to present to Key, in commemoration of your induction into the Pinball Expo Service and Support Hall of Fame, October 18th, 2024, Rob Burke, Expo Chairman. Well, this is a unique turn of events because I'm much more comfortable with a notepad and a camera um, behind the scenes. <laughs> so uh, this was quite a surprise and uh, I, I'm very grateful for the honor and very humbled. And um, this is my very first Pinball Expo and I am just blown away by everyone who's here, all the games, the service companies. It's quite a remarkable journey that you've taken the pinball world on. Thank you, Rob. Thank you to everybody who's ever been involved with putting on Pinball Expo. And uh, just really congratulations to everyone who's here. Again, thank you very much. This is really quite an honor.
you know, I have a, I don't have any memory of not being in this industry. I was born into it. And I have a lot of fond memories of learning to read Replay Magazine as a child. <laughs> it was one of the many things that we had. And it's pretty amazing, you know, coming to this expo all these years. And I can say with absolute confidence, this is the best expo I've ever seen. Um, the best people, the most amount of games, um, the enthusiasm, the energy for this industry. And you didn't always used to hear the word community as much as we hear it now. Like, we really internalize that as a community. And I think that's thanks to just a handful of people who are the big drivers behind that, especially Jody and John, who took a gamble. And I don't know if anybody remembers, you know, 20 years ago, you couldn't play brand new games at these expos. It was hard to find them, actually. And now there's hundreds of them here. It's absolutely incredible. So, um, so when Rob asked me to present this award, an hour ago, I was like, oh, how am I going to prepare that? But then I realized, oh, this is actually easy because I've given this award before this year. And it is, I can't describe any more of it without giving it away. So, Emoto, get up here. <laughs> you know, who the face of the next generation of pinball. I had to check my notes. She's only been in this industry for five years, <laughs> give or take, with us, yeah. And before that, you had a Moto Arcade, the, one of the very best pod, uh, podcast streams, TV shows, whatever you want to call it. Um, but Emoto is a master of all media forms, a brilliant producer, a brilliant videographer, writer, photographer, uh, team motivator, event producer. You've seen all of her dozens of trade show booths. She's produced for Marco and Stern and other companies around this industry. And most importantly, she's a connector and she inspires people to join this industry. I think there's m many people, I like to ask people these shows, hey, who inspired you to get into pinball? And there's only a handful of names you hear over and over again. And Emoto is one of them. So, yes. And Jack Danger sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, why, why is it always about Jack? <laughs> so, um, you know, everyone's familiar with all her work. She starred, you know, the, the Marco Pintech live stream during the pandemic. Uh, it's been doing that strong for dozens, I don't know, I mean, hundreds of episodes even. Um, you know, she spends all, even, I, I don't know when she sleeps. I think she either has a stunt double or a clone that we don't know about, but, um, you know, she spends time with Project Pinball all over the country, dedicating games everywhere. Um, a driving force in the homebrew resurgence here. I know I've talked to many people that she's inspired directly and, you know, really, and, and she's even like driving pinball fashion, right? So, you know, look at that. So, rock and all. Oh, we, we got skirts? Where's the Marco ones? Come on. <laughs> so, um, and I go on and on and on, but I think most of us know most of her achievements already based off of how much everyone clapped for already. So, Without further ado, Miss Emoto Harney, in commemoration for introduction. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Quick and humble. Thank you all so much. I love all of you so much. I love supporting everyone in here and everyone downstairs and in the pinball world uh, it was really paul's dad mark Mantletort, that was a mentor to me and um i know impacted so many of y'all too about you know just keeping pinball alive and keeping pinball the landfill so i took his message and i am going to run with it for the rest of my life and i hope to see you guys uh, with me along the way. Let's keep pinball alive. It does beautiful things for all of us. So, but thanks. Okay, we have Gary Flower, Flower for a uh, brief presentation. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to keep Hi everyone. Hi. Right, it's a privilege that Rob has given me here tonight to um, induct the next person into the UK Pinball Hall of Fame. And sitting down there listening to all the other nominees going in, 
I realised this guy doesn't tick any of the usual boxes for getting into the Hall of Fame. He's going in because um, in, for 55 years uh, he's been raising global awareness of pinball. Yet he's not in the industry. He's not American. He's not even a pinball collector. He's not in the hobby. Uh, but he put the spotlight on pinball in 1969 when uh, an album was released, which many of you will be aware of, uh, Tommy, with a hit single, Pinball Wizard. Uh, unfortunately, Pete Townsend can't be with us tonight. However, I've got messages from him, uh, but first I would just like to read out the induction, which says, Pete Townsend is hereby inducted into the UK Pinball Hall of Fame in recognition of your contribution to the global awareness and enjoyment of pinball. Yeah. Thank you, Pete Townsend, for everything you've done. Yeah. And uh, he's asked me to share a bit of pinball trivia with you about the lyrics to Pinball Wizard. Those of you that are familiar with the lyrics may recognize the line, uh, the Bally Table King. Originally, and not a lot of people know this, it was the Gottlieb Table King. But when uh, the band contacted Gottlieb and said, is it okay to use your name? Uh, the message came back, no thank you, we don't need uh, to be associated with rock and roll. I'm not sure the actual words, it was a long time ago. And hence, the lyrics were changed to the Bally Table King. The other thing uh, Pete said uh, to pass on is that um, he used pinball uh, in the rock opera, Tommy, as a metaphor for the games that we go through in, in the giant game of life. And I think the message there is play games and enjoy them. And with that, I'd like to thank you all. This will I, I will get a photo to Rob of Pete with the trophy, with the award, so that it can go up on the Expo website. Yeah, ask him to call me. I want to make sure that yeah. he gets it, okay? Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. Yeah, you say that. Hold that right here. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap it up here very, very shortly. Will the following people come up front here? Uh, Dave Marston, if you'll sit down here. Carson, you got something to give this young man? Dave Marston. Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor, if you'll come up front. John Peterson. John, are you here? John was here, John Peterson. And Gary Flower, if you'll turn around, guys, and show everyone one of these jackets. So what we do is every 10 years, we give these jackets out to people that have come to every show. So these guys have been to all 40 X. Well, here comes John Peterson. Gary is the only one that says international ambassador on his. So, guys, I thank you all. Everyone, I thank you for being here tonight. It was a great night. Thank you.